Hello? It is October 14th, 2022, at least where I slash we are. And it's active guest stream number 29.1. We are revisited by Shauna Dobson. And today we'll be discussing the paper with Dobson and Fields, Making Up Our Minds, Imaginative Deconstruction in Math Art, 1920 to the Present. We'll have a presentation with some interspersed discussion followed by more discussion. So thank you again for joining and please take it away. Hi, Daniel. Thank you again for the invite. Thank you for noticing our paper and for welcoming us here. So we will be discussing and deconstructing um, the idea of personality and mind and self through a very beautiful interlay of math art, as we call it. So um, we're going to lay down the sort of heavy argument about what we're actually lacing together. And then we're going to end with juxtaposing two mathematical giants, Groth and Deacon Erdos, and using them as a case point to evaluate this investigation of ours into why we're saying the mind is made up and what the self is. So it's a little text heavy, but we're going to pause every once in a while so that we can get, um, you know, understand what's actually happening here. I think no figure would do justice to what we're saying, possibly the perfectoid uh, shape I have on the front, which I've talked about before, but I'll save the mathy part for the ending part. So the main idea, what we say, um, oh, and I want to say we also um, gave a, a snippet of this talk at the recent Models of Consciousness conference in Stanford, so people want to look at it there, um, but you can find our, the, the paper on the Phil archive right now. So the main idea is that the cognitive sciences actually tell us that the self is a construct. So we're actually going to use mathematics to give it full uh, expression and actually abstract the self to what we're calling a Grothendieck site. So the self is going to be what, we, what Deleuze and Guattari have called a hesiety. So it's an actual ephemeral thisness and nowness. And so we actually claim that we actually make up our minds. So when we're saying making up our minds, we actually are, we're playing there. So that our acts are public and that they communicate effectively becomes what we're going to call a dialetheistic paradox. So it's a limit paradox that happens when thought runs up against its own limits. And as you all know, like Chris and I are not afraid to sort of like, let's take this concept and push it, uh, push it till it breaks. Or in the words of like Bards, push it past the antiprastical recrimination. So we love playing around in this heavy, heavy intersection of math philosophy, philosophy of mind, um, to figure out like, what is this self? So we invoke a, a new mathematical formalism by Peter Schulze and Dustin Clausen called a condensed set to formalize the notion of a self as a site. So we, we're going to mathematize what the self is. And um, then we're going to create an event-dependent constructed time of retrospective and perspective memories. Event-dependent, not that it's independent. And so this is an alternative to the objective time of uh, temporal logic and its descendants. So we discuss this in, in the paper, and I'm trying to give a snippet. So in essence, this new condensed formalism that's going to invoke some sheaves gives a representation to how a self as a site experiences memory. So if you remember, Chris and I are very puzzled by why, why do you experience memories? Not, not why do you have them? You can have some kind of like, you know, acceptation argument about why you actually have a memory, right? And going down the DNA line and stuff like that. But why do you experience memory? And can you imagine the first creature that actually did? So if we actually authenticate an object by observing it again, and that requires a lot of memory through the RAM, um, and we conclude that an inferential action or a creation has returned. So we play around with this notion of return in the sense of eternal return in the sense of Nietzsche. Deleuze does a very brilliant discussion of what eternal return actually means, that nothing is actually returning. The only thing that returns is pure multiplicity. So it is a world without being, without unity, and so we love that world. So if authentication claims that something returns, what does return? Because quantum mechanics is not going to say that. So in the pink, I've highlighted that, can this notion of sites or this condensed frame, um, this condensed structure, can that actually reframe authentication dialetheistically? This is what I'm very, very, very perplexed in. So 
If you have a notion of dialetheism, which we do, anytime you have a self-reference, a system referencing itself is going to create these paradoxes. What does that mean for us in terms of authentication? So we're going to conclude that the greatest imaginary construct is really our own mind, but to call these constructs ours is to abuse notation. So um, we call the I reified. We say that I is an experience that we actually reify. So it's something that you've actually made up. Chris said this brilliantly, and I put it together. An identity is a short-term, weak approximation. Something you, quote, get away with, but not for very long. So again, Chris and I are saying that time is not this continuous, like, beautiful thing, that it's actually pieced, pieced, pieced. And above every point in time lies a sheaf. And I know I've, I've discussed sheafs before. So above every point in uh, every point. Yeah, it's tricky. So if every point is modeled as something singular and you authenticate at every point, then what you're actually doing is like a grand interpolation. So to say that you have an identity is actually tricky. So quantum mechanics is actually going to justify this proof. It's going to say, well, isolated systems undergo unitary evolution, which produces non-separable states. So this is irrefutable. So we say me plus everything but me. It's, it is an isolated system. And we take everything seriously. So Asymptotically, I am actually entangled with everything else. So neither of us has a separate identity. Right? So we are we're opening we're opening our arms and saying, you know, someone help. So maybe we only get away with what this is in each instantaneous experience. This is what we're saying. Uh, it includes experiences of memories, but it's completely meaningless other than for instantaneous instantaneous. So that meaning is something that we actually have to continually assign to this notion of instantaneousness. So in this paper, we focus on a few questions that we say, what are we actually doing when we do mathematics or art or science or philosophy that explains the actual correlation, what we've called math art? So what are we actually doing when we do anything, a creative act in general? So how do we account for that trajectory through the 20th century? It's very, very heavy that you move from a sense of solidity into extreme abstraction, fragmentation, depersonalization. Why have all the creative disciplines followed this trajectory? They seem to abstract, subtract. Uh, what are we left with? So, you know, we claim that, well, what has been deconstructed across all the creative disciplines is actually the self. The self, in particular, the confident Cartesian self as an independent, objective observer and a directed voluntary actor. So... This is done. So in, while we were working, I asked Chris all, all the time, why can we never ac actually access what causes a thought? And so he would say, well, no finite system can contain a complete representation of its own dynamics. Okay, you run into a problem of self-reference. Why are there no things in themselves? Well, because quantum theory is going to strike us as self-evidently true, at least as a description of the interaction between any finite system and its world and its world. I still to this day ask, what is a thought? What is a thought? And why is it that maybe my thought is somebody else's memory? What is that? Is somebody's memory my thought? You know, <laughs> Deleuze talks about this body without organs, which I'm going to get to. And he opens the, the paragraph with, at any rate, you have one. So thoughts, what are these? At any rate, you have them. Uh, so we're just, we're, 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 we're grasping here. A thought is a, a modal, as in like a, a sensory mode. It's an emotional experience that's generated by imagination and not perception. But what does imagination mean from an actual like quantum theory perspective? So it must be a source of classical information. So hence, it must be written on a boundary, but it differs in a significant way from an action on quote, the world, because it's my imaginary world. So we're really, we really dive into this paper is like, how do imagination and sensation compete? So there's a central contradiction, which I'm going to just kind of go quickly through. Experiencers really want to understand the source of their experience. But it's actually impossible in principle. All you really do is just overlay the experience with the theory. And then, but what produced them is still inaccessible in principle. So category theory can help uh, mitigate this a little bit. So, you know, there's always going to be morphisms acting on whatever structure we call it imminent. So morphisms, you, you deem something as imminent, you have morphisms acting on the structure. Um, otherwise, you would have zero change. Otherwise, you would have fixed agents, we call it of temporal width zero that would experience becoming, but they never become. So there is, there would be no change. Um, yeah, so the fundamental contradiction, any philosophy of becoming is that it requires an assumption of processes outside of any possible experience. So we're gonna use sheaves and category theory to kind of get through this. So 
one of our main ideas is linking imagination and, and the free inner energy principles. So we're actually going to say that all imaginative activity is both constructive and active. We actually have an agent, um, a literal sense of action by the agent on the agents actually on, on their world. So using the variational free energy principle, we're going to say we consider all creative activity, inclu uh, including all imaginative activity, as actually problem solving. We're, creation, we're creating novelty and uncertainty in the service of testing and improving a model of the experienced world, 100%. So acting creatively is that you're actually going to act on the world with the intention of provoking an informative response from the world. So we say to make art is to perform an experiment. An immediate consequence of this is that all art is provocative, experimental, all art is informative, just as science is informative to the extent and in proportion that it's provocative and experimental. So we really hit this hard, we go right, and right into it, and we say, you know, mathematics is actually going to exemplify and express the very particular dissolution of the self with the greatest clarity and poetry. For some reason, mathematics can get a, a, a horrible represent, rep, uh, reputation that it's like, Absolutely, like devoid of creativity, and we're saying it's not. So Grothendieck's notion of a sight it actually really encapsulates what, this whole notion. It removes the solidity and locatedness of the traditional idea of a point, right? Classical physics is based on the idea of modeling particles as points. Math is that the Grothendieck sight is actually going to kind of destroy that. You know, it replaces the notion of a point with something that is structureless and ephemeral. And moreover, the notion of uh, a condensed set is going to be like uh, a notion of sheaves on a point. So it's no longer about the point. So we've kind of like thrown out ontology with that. So category theory is going to allow these structures to be transferred. And then um, so we're going to introduce the society line and uh, we're going to uh, look at Francis Bacon's work as like an art artistic provocateur of this stuff. So when we say our greatest construct is like, you know, our mind, we're left with we left with the question of how we as artists or scientists or as Bayesian uncertainty minimizers, how can we actually see each other as fellow agents communicate and share ideas? This is actually really beautiful. It makes you ask, what is language? And what does it actually mean to say that art and math are actually languages? What does it mean to be a speaker or a writer when the deconstructionist challenge is, you know, challenges the very notion of objectivity and say from bars that a text unity lies not in its origin, but in its destination? That's powerful, not in its origin, but it's dependent on the person reading it. So quoting bars again, we will no longer be fooled by the arrogant anti practical recriminations of good society in favor of the very thing it sets aside, ignores, smothers, or destroys. So we're going apart and through the actual notion of what is mind, what is self. So does a shared semantics, can it even be, be assumed? So when we say that all action is creative, we're going to get a little neurological here. Um, creativity, it actually poses a complete paradox to the very antiseptic Western philosophical tradition, which is saying that, you know, it values reflective, deliberate, rules-based thinking, type two cognition, <clears throat> over what's a little more wild, which is the immediate, intuitive, unreflective type one or process one judgment. So Chris is heavily trained in this section, so he's Read of insight, it actually has the phenomenology of type one cognition, but a greater value than most type two cognition. It's called the outlier, right? So we're actually putting together phenomenology of the outlier. So, you know, and again, the Western discomfort is understandable. Uh, one of the key attributes of an outlier is it's unpredictability, uh, unpredictability. So the academy from like Plato onward, you know, is designed to render the insights of others formulaic and reproducible. So but then you've got you, what's beautiful are these flow states of cognition. Uh, super athletes go into this state, right? Um, in which activities are performed with the automaticity that comes with deep experience and expertise. So you have something that automatic that's actually coming from you know, excellent trained, but you always talk about anyone in flow state, they say, I'm getting out of my way. There is no I anymore. So you combine the phenomenology of type one cognition with a feeling of ease or bliss or ecstasy or automatic pilot, whatever they call it, you know, and you get a best performance out of it. So I'll, I'll talk a, a few more slides and then we'll pause for like any, any like putting together um, right before we get to Francis Bacon. So we say imagination and sensation compete. This is actually really beautiful to me. Um, uh, Chris and I find ourselves on opposite sides of the, of the aphantasia spectrum, which is like uh, the aphantasia um, is uh, classified as uh, someone that it does not have a, or it, it is a deficit in a very rich 
um, visualization um, versus the hyperphantasia, which is someone who has so much rich visualization and memory that the reality seems um, dull compared to the actual imaginative experience, right? That the imagination is so overwhelming. So it's beautiful that we write on opposite sides of this spectrum and we can, and I think that's what makes this work so powerful. So if imagination and sensation compete, how? Well, deliberate thought, what is deliberate thought? So it's a sequence of ideas that's presented to consciousness, but by unconscious processes. So I found this curious. So the real work is happening below the threshold of awareness. We've always asked, what are these fundamental units of life? If anyone knows anyone who's really sick, the personality is definitely the last thing that sort of comes online. It is, or the organs functioning, is the heart functioning, and then comes little personality and appetite in these things. So what is this threshold of awareness? And what are these fundamental units of life? Why should so much be going on below it? Why? So then we have this hint, imagination. Maybe we can gleam a little bit of what's going on neurologically by what's happening in the imaginative realm. So we say the ability to have sensory and emotional experiences without engaging sensory input. So this is uh, Chris and Kosselin and Andrew and Hannah have tried to identify what imagination is. It's sensory though. It is sensory because it does engage the same large scale functional neural networks that process sensory inputs. I myself did not know this. I myself, and I told Chris, I said, you know, when I'm doing a lot of math or something, I try not to leave. I find myself uh, not able to operate like heavy machinery. And I've, I've spoken out about this, like very, very honestly. And he was like, Shanna, that's because those, they actually compete for the same hardware. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. So he, in the paper, he really, he uh, gives an example of like one of his professors that would speak, but was holding the wall at the same time to remember that the wall is there, but the imaginary field is so full. So we talk about resource sharing. So sensation and imagination compete. They render inner speech difficult in noisy environments and visualization difficult during visually demanding tasks like driving. You don't want to be like thinking of <laughs> thinking of something like a perfectoid spit and you're driving, like that is a red light, you know, stop. <laughs> so sensory deprivation actually enhances imagination. Why? So we, I'll just go quickly through reality monitoring. There's, um, you know, the unintentional blindness of abstract thinkers, somebody like me, you cannot physically see the outside because your mind is thinking of everything else. This can be chalked up to competition from imagination. So again, sensory networks can be taken over by imagination and then uh, imaginative experiences, episodic memories and thinking. These are very present to awareness because being both sensory and emotional, they're, treat they're treated by the brain as both important. So this gets really interesting. So this, this reality monitoring network involving the most phylogenetically recent areas of the prefrontal cortex really has the task of distinguishing sensory inputs from imagination. Do we have a distinction? Can I tell what's real versus what's imaginative? And we want to label them as such an awareness. So um, in neuroscience, you know, you can we we experience these imaginings as memories and pictures, and you know, we're going to use them to understand the world. So the picture of the brain is employing all of its available resources to model the world, right? Um, and, and to act appropriately within it has been given a beautiful, elegant mathematical formulation. Uh, Friston and Fields have both done this. The free energy principle we have worked on this, that any, any system will behave so as to minimize to the extent possible its uncertainty about its environment's future actions on it. Absolutely 100% here. So we formalize it as a variational free energy principle. So it's actually a thermodynamic principle that applies to all classical and quantum physical systems, not just to brains. So we're actually, it drives the process of active inference, incorporates learning about the world as it presents itself actively probing the world to provoke informative responses. So that you're constantly performing all of this, you know, um, is beautiful. And it also leads to, a, it's, it's dynamic. It is dynamic. And we're actually trying to figure out what is the self in a free in energy principle and the, uh, what happens to the self as, you know, as you apply a variation to this. And um, the time to support such an elegant theory like FEP. So I should pause there to see anything else before we launch and just to the next chunk of the actual RD stuff. Great. Well, there's already so much. I know. For sorry. Some the, <laughs> for some of the formalisms, I'll look forward to it. Uh, mm -hmm. A few comments on the point of math and heavy machinery. They say don't derive and drive. <laughs> That's what okay. I've heard. That's great. Um, <laughs> then on the type one and type two, 
it made me think about how rather than uh, a category of thought or simple modes that are exclusionary to each other, type one and type two are like axes in a space of behaviors. And so there are quadrants, so to speak, and you're speaking to the phenomenology of the outlier, which is that flow with skill and mm. novelty. And then one last point was you talked about active imagination, and that fits in very well with some of the computational models in active inference, where mm. attention is a policy selection. So it puts attention as mental action in the same exact formalisms that we would use for bodily policy selection and and uh, the choosing from affordances, attention and the inner world is like policy selection on inner landscapes. Mm -hmm. And I think there's many angles to explore with what does it mean to create? What does it mean to recreate? What's recreational? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to member? What does it mean to remember? What is this aspect of initial generation and what is the aspect of regeneration when we use our generative model as a regenerative model, potentially authenticating the observations like you described earlier? Wow, that is so like, yeah, so beautifully said. I'm really interested in these inner landscapes. Okay, yeah. Once I talk about uh, Bacon and the BW, uh, Body Without Organs, I would love to see what you think after that. Excellent. Okay, let's let's carry on. I love these talks. All right. So uh, I think I briefly mentioned Hesiody before. I do think it's overlooked in the um, in like the the realm of neurology, and maybe we should take a look at it. So um, Deleuze and Atari co uh, coined this notion of Hesiody, um, and what is this, right? So the Hesiody, uh, we're going to get to get to the definition in about two seconds, but it's a new take on what individuality actually means. So it's an individuality that is devoid of, that is trying to free itself from subjectivity. So they say like trying to be a subject, sometimes that's actually too much to ask for someone who may be like, you know, hurting or in a state of like, you know, uh, extreme pressure, maybe didn't do so well on something. Actually, requiring someone to be a subject could be too high of a toll. And an individuality, um, a Hesiody evokes an individuality to something less than a subject. I found it so freeing. I was like, can I just please be a horse today? Can I please just, um, you know, can I be a glass of water? Can I have the being and the affordances of a glass of water and put aside the subject just for a second? I need to rest. Right. So this is the kind of thought process that like happens. And all of us know that in intense academic programs, you have to kind of rest, you know. Um, so when we talk about, again, the neuroscience um, of creativity. Um, so what, what what does it mean to have a decreased activation of the sense of self? So we asked this, <laughs> Chris said this so funny. What is this sense of self and how does it relate to the self? Sense of self and how does it actually relate to the self? Can you actually parse this? Should we say that the self observes the sense of self? Or does the sense of self observe itself, right? And I know FEP can guide us through something like that. There's not a lot of propositions that could, right? If you don't have FEP, you may not be able to like fine tune this and this kind of dynamicism. Uh, most people would just jump right over it. So these like the reflexive play on words, which is the very ground of like priest, um, you know, uh, uh, logic paradoxes and, and thought paradoxes, and which, which he calls limit paradoxes. So anytime you put it like a self-reference on a system, you're going to have these problems. So um, we, we, we invoke this notion of an eigenform. It's a fixed point of a recursive process. And we're going to say that like um, saying, you know, that you have this, this iteration, this recursion actually generalizes the idea of an identity operator, and it's going to implement the eternal return. So we're trying to sort of mix this reflexivity with the often with authenticating an object and what does that actually mean with the eternal return so again Deleuze brilliantly says like it's the law of a world without being without unity without identity far from presupposing the one or the same the eternal return constitutes the only unity of the multiple as such the only identity of what actually differs so coming back is the only being of becoming 
And the, uh, the function of the eternal return as being is never to identify, but to authenticate. So those two, once again, we are finding two worlds that are colliding on the authentication, different phenomenologies. So if we conceptualize math, art, and all creative activity as ways of distilling experience into meaningful and memorable summaries or abstracts. So how do you, how do you impose meaning? What, why does an agent uh, impose meaning and how? External meaning, internal meaning on the internal landscapes. So we're saying that these are actually technologies for preserving useful um, and significant aspects of experience over time. But we we 100% say memory is constructive. It pr it requires an act of authentication. You got to be real careful about what's actually being authenticated. Like you said earlier, member versus remember. So that qualifier re is actually kind of troubling. So uh, Chris Valiantly said the Dark Ages lost not so much text, but the ability to read them. So we say if, if identification is by definition post hoc after the fact, what is actually being authenticated? What is this? Once again, I think this is another limit paradox. I'm taking the notion of authentication and ramming it until it's going to fall apart. So Deleuze says society is, again, another mode of individuation, very different from that of a person, subject, thing, or substance. Uh, you reserve the name society for it. A season, a winter, a summer, an hour, a date. They have a perfect individuality lacking nothing. It is not a thing or a subject. A degree of heat and intensity of white, perfect individualities. Notice this abstraction away from the subject. We talk about the aha moment. We're going to say that the aha moment does not obey the ordinary time of doing and happening. So if there really is no self present during the aha moment, who is experiencing anything? Time without present, I without I. This is nothing of which one could say that experience, a form of knowledge, would either reveal or conceal it. Commensurate with it, there is no faith. That is Blanchot. Powerful. So we're invoking heavy continental philosophy at the same time of a neurological phenomena, the aha moment. So Blanchot is powerful there. Commensurate with that aha moment, there is no faith. What is that? Meaning there is nothing measurable in that moment. So we say that the aha time of bliss obeys the time of hesiety. It's, it's, it's a completely different time. It's that flow time. It's sharply contrasted with the situational time of doing and, and things to be done. So we say the individual the individuation of a life is not the same as, it, as the individuation of the subject that leads it or serves as its support. So hesiety time, not it's not in the same time, the same temporality. I think this is beautifully said. So eon, it's the indefinite time of the event. It's floating. It's actually, it's something that is both going to happen and it's just happened. So Blanchot also has this beautiful notion of passivity. Absolutely passivity, no self-present to categorize the other as a depersonal of time of bliss, it's almost as an abdication. So all of this is self-abdication, either through mathematics or philosophy. So in this state, there really is no self to grant the authorization to say that anything happens. If there's no self present, who's to say that anything happens according to the, the inner world of experience? So uh, he has this quote, he says, I, I would prefer not to. That statement is an abstention, which never had to be decided upon. It precedes all decisions and which is not so much a denial as more than that, an abdication. I thought that was beautiful. It belongs to the infinitiveness of patience. So that sort of hard infinity, no dialectical intervention can take hold of such passivity. So we've fallen outside the world of being outside. We're immobile proceeding with a slow and even step destroyed men come and go. This is the realm. I love this realm. Can In this realm, can we mathematize what's going on here with FEP insights and condensed formalism? So when you get to a source monitoring, there's a sense of uncapturable time, unreportable events occur, and possibly intended, but uncontrollable actions happen, and it's forced onto us by quantum theory. Quantum theory is a beautiful theory about non-fungible or unshareable information. Now, that's precisely the quantum phase information that distinguishes and individuates quantum states. It enforces a radical uniqueness onto quantum systems, radically unique, challenges the very, the very idea of fully transparent information sharing, non-fungibility. So uh, if we use the time of facility, then it puts the, the reality monitoring in a new light. In our own reality, we're monitoring, including our own ability to remember and authenticate. But we are, more, moreover, only monitoring a simulacrum of the event itself. It is non-fungible and unrecordable. So we say that reality monitoring becomes a rationalizing reconstruction, a form of motivated reasoning. It serves the need for a stability doesn't really exist. So the continuity of time, we are hardcore claiming that it's illusory. So let's get into the self and jump into Groth and Deacon Erdos. This is really fun. So we bring up Jung and some beautiful things that, uh, that Jung was thinking about.
So the reportable self, the Shanna that, you know, participated yesterday, that did all the things in the past, has plans for the future, the self that has beliefs and desires and other attitudes, the self with relationships, right? This is the constructed self of memory in, in, in words of Seth. So the reportable self, the, the experienced self, the I that speaks and thinks, this is the I that directs the body, it's conscious. But severe, sufficiently severe anterograde amnesia can almost surgically remove the experienced self. I spoke of Clive Ring before. Clive Ring has lost personal memory, still has motor memory. We'll walk in and say, I, you know, I, I've never seen a doctor before in my life. They visit him all the time. I've never seen a piano before in my life, but can play one. Um, what, what sort of experience is this? Clive has about a six second memory, right? Where's the authentication in a six second memory, right? So uh, Clive, you know, Clive's use of I is profoundly different than mine. So I, Clive using an I, this actually has no enduring first person subject reference. And what can we make of that? So we're, formally, we're going to formally distinguish this constructed Cartesian self from the ungraspable self of Hesiade, what Jung is going to call a virtual point. So Jung started all this virtual point. It's a virtual point on some kind of scale between unconscious and conscious. So our interest here is in what this experience self is like, how it, how it differs. So here's the, in the aphantasia spectrum that I spoke about uh, a bit earlier. Um, a lot of people live without significant internally verbalized thoughts. Now, for people in academia or people like Daniel and I, like I'm talking to myself all the time. <laughs> so imagine a world where there is no internal like verbalized thoughts. So uh, Zeman actually sharpened this distinction by introducing the Fantasia spectrum. So people capable of experience rich, multimodal imaginings on one end, people severely efficient uh, in imagination in at least one modality on the other. So we actually write in the paper that we ourselves, the present authors, are on opposite ends of the spectrum for the modality of vision. I think Chris will remember like pure text and mine has so many colors in it, I don't even know what's happening. <laughs> so aphantasia, it applies to all uses of the imagination, including the reconstruction of episodic memories. There are some people who have no, bio no biographical memory. Aphantasics also experience deficits in episodic memory, the purely verbal textbook-like episodic memories of C.F. Crisfields. So curiously, but dream imagery can be preserved in aphantastics. Dream imagery can be preserved. So somehow it's the conscious attention to imagination that is deficit. And I found that perplexing. But then Chris said, well, it's not really surprising. Conscious attention is a competitive process. Who or what wins the competition is not voluntarily chosen. So many things are competing here. So let's jump into the body without organs. So we say if the self is actually a construction, what, what, is its, what are its identity conditions, right? So what guarantees that the self that I construct now is the same as the self I constructed as a child, as a student, or even yesterday? How can we make any sense of any proposed continuity of self over time? Chris and I are still on this, right? I, I am like enchanted by the notion of over time. What does that actually mean? So this standard idea of like a, a closest uh, like causal continuer, like the I, the I somehow moves through something. <laughs> and it doesn't really straightforwardly apply is claiming that I am still the constructor of myself merely begs the question again. So uh, you, we, maybe we could see learning or experience generally as modifying the self either, either gradually or by, or by saltations, which we think maybe that's what it is. So to lose and guitar, I posit this body without organs, right? We're really going at it here. So now where they say that a body is actually not determined, not defined by the form that it determines, that determines it, nor is it actually a determinate substance or subject, um, nor is it determined by the organs that possess it. So our toe is notorious for waging like war against the organs, right? I don't want the organs. I'm independent of them. And so they, de they define this body without organs, which is actually trying to free itself from the determinism and say that it's a collectivity. It's a, an, an, an assembling elements, things, plants, animals, tools. Um, it's not my body without organs. Instead, the me, the me is on it or what remains of me, unalterable and changing in form, crossing threshold. So Burroughs famously wrote about this, about how um, in some people a certain deficit, like functioning, uh, organs would just seemingly sprout anywhere. The crossing threshold is really fun. So it actually, the BWO it proceeds without uh, by contagion, rather than by cate categor categorizable uh, identities that, quote, stay stratified. And so they call the three axes of stratification, organization, signification and subjectivity. So they say after all the organism, it's not at all the body, 
it's a stratum. It's a stratum on the body without organs. So in contrast to the pressure of continually having the same self over time, whatever that actually means, they offer quite the opposite. I love this, this quote in the text. Uh, this is in the Capitalism and Schizophrenia book. So they say, when a psychoanalysis says, stop, find yourself again. We should say instead, let's go further still. We haven't found our body without organs yet. We haven't sufficiently, sufficiently dismantled ourselves. Substitute forgetting or anamnesis, experimentation for interpretation. Find your beauty, be body without organs. Find out how to make it. Most importantly, they say it has nothing to do with fantasy. There is nothing to interpret. So Deleuze and Atari famously are trying to overthrow ontology, get rid of interpretation, which seems to classify the very thing they're trying to free. So through the BWO, I made this connection with Francis Bacon, uh, which I thought was really powerful. So most people see the work and they are like shocked at the level of the nervous system or something like this. So Francis Bacon did some wild things. And Deleuze has a very beautiful book on him called The Hysteria of Painting. So Deleuze views the, the becoming of painting in the form of a logic of sensation. It functions through hysteria by way of a primordial free representative sensation. It's foundational to and over any accessory forms. That was my take on it. So Deleuze claims that painting in the sense of Bacon becomes a hysteria it can, or it converts hysteria because it makes presence immediately visible, immediately visible. Painting directly attempts to release the presences beneath representation beyond representation. The color system itself is a sense of direct action on the nervous system. Watch the reactions people have looking at a Bacon painting. If there's something, what is that? And Deleuze is trying to like classify that. He says, this is not a hysteria of the painter, but a hysteria of the painting. So with painting, hysteria becomes art, or rather with the painter, hysteria becomes painting. So in a sense, where, do, where does the BWO come in? The body without organs right here. Well, it says painting liberates the eye from its adherence to the organism. The eye becomes the virtually, the polyvagant indeterminate organism that sees the body without organs as pure presence. So painting gives us eyes all over, in the ear, in the stomach, in the lungs, the painting actually breathes. So another piece that Deleuze finds in Bacon's work is the phenomena of autoscopia. Autoscopia is the phenomena where the body is felt under the body. So there's transitory organs that are felt underneath the organization of the fixed organs. And he says something like, it's no longer my head, but I feel myself inside a head. I see and I see myself inside a head. Is there a psychosis in the world that might include this sort of hysterical condition? So what if we geometrize the autoscopia, right? Here's where the math comes in. Um, Deleuze calls math a monster slang, and that's probably because it can do things like this. So the, if the body, um, Deleuze talks about the body passing through itself to escape itself. So the body is sick of the organization. It's going to pass through itself to escape itself. And you'll see these various points in Bacon's work and the triptychs and things like that. So it escapes from itself through the open mouth or the stomach or through the throat or through the point of an umbrella. And the presence of a body without organs underneath the organism, uh, the presence of transitory organs under the organic representation. So again, with the BWO, you are freeing. Um, so it's almost like um, the hysteria of painting is allowing the BWO to sit on side of the color system. So again, Deleuze is not advocating any kind of deconstruction, uh, destruction. He's saying care and caution must be ex exercised to produce such a, I called it a solarium spatium of intensities. So what is sought? It's not forlorn bodies. So they make this very clear in their book. They're not advocating something destructive. Not, nothing forlorn or, or um, um, you know, bodies that have emptied themselves of their organs. He's saying make it more dynamic. Look for the point at which they could patiently and momentarily dismantle the organization of the organs that we call the organism. So body, I claimed that a body passing through itself was a body without organs that became um, a hysaity. And then, um, so if you can see the body passing through itself as a hysaity, um, uh, then you can see the body passing through itself in the ways of, Deleuze calls it like the spastics and the hyperesthetics that are indicated by wiped or scrub zone, again, on, on Francis's uh, triptychs. And there's anesthetics and paralytics by missing zones. So you can also get a, phenomen a phenomenology about what is missing in these pieces. So he says the zones are actually rhizomes. But what's really beautiful is that when the body is in indistinguishable from the paint colors that are used to produce it, then the body actually passes through the paint at the same time as it passes through itself. So 
Bacon's form of painting is hysteria, it's actually Hesaidi. Once again, recalling that climate, wind, season, hour, um, they're not of another nature than the things that populate them. They sleep and awaken with them. So Deleuze says famously, um, this sentence should be read without a pause. The animal stalks at five o'clock. The animal stalks at five o'clock. No subject object like um, Coppola here. So I, I kind of put a spin on that and I said, likewise, this should be read without a pause. Hysteria, painting, body without organs, becoming painting, becoming animal. So um, we're about to jump into Graf and Erdős. Maybe let's pause and see if any, let's recap BWO and uh, and then uh, I'll get to Erdős and wrap it up. Okay, I'll just add Sorry. a few, <laughs> I'll add a few <laughs> comments, just try to connect some dots for those yeah, who please. are um, painting along. So first, authenticate. That reminded me of how we describe our experience or indeed pleasurable experiences as authentic. And also authenticate has a more technical definition with cryptographic verification. So there's mm -hmm. some relationships with kind of lock and key cryptographic ciphers mm -hmm. and the integrity of existence. Um, you mentioned stratification and you used the terms organized, signified, and subjected. And that made me, th and you said the, the body is a strata. And I thought of riverbanks and the body in development does go through being a point with a zygote. And then it's uh, moving through topological and geometric phases. Now it's a two layer, now it's a trilaminar disc. And so we have a stratification through development and that's part of like the evolution of developmental complexity. Then art as site, kind of disassembling, but embracing this de-pointing, de-literalization or something of the point and seeing performance art and all art as performance, but the locus of performance, kind of like the cloud of the performance is the site. It's like, mm -hmm. you have to go to the show. You have mm -hmm. to be there. It's about the experience. And then even a type of uh, aesthetics like fashion, there's like the narrative that comes along with the t-shirt that might look the same, but then when somebody has a different quantum reference frame or aesthetic mm -hmm. reference frame, it can mean a lot more. And then just the last interesting point was that escape from autoscopia is quite an interesting idea. And um, should we pursue? How should we pursue? Why would we pursue such approaches? Just because we can drive off the road or drive off one road or turn right or turn left or take off these affordances that cognitive entities have how should they be regarded and selected as to not imperil oneself if that hmm. is even something to be avoided oh wow okay i can't wait to talk about that one more yeah escaping autoscopia or autoscopia and like flipping it, internalizing that even more. Um, yeah, this is excellent. Okay, let's see if we get if we can link all of that with comparing two mathematical giants, undeniably, Groth and Deacon Erdos. So there is a fields medalist that recently tried to, um, again, you don't want to classify anybody, but they seem to follow different tracks, whereas Erdos is more of a uh, problem solver, right? Problem solver leaving, um, you know, like little jewels, like I'll pay you if you can solve this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Rampant, publishing so many papers and things like that. Versus Groth and Deke, laying heavy, heavy foundation. I'm not sure was concerned. Again, I would have loved to have met him, uh, to have met him. But um, um, I know not, not particularly concerned with problem solving, but theory building, theory builder, right? Uh, I, I can't even list everything, right? So, um, when we, we juxtapose it, we're saying which self and which time do these two mathematical giants actually obey? And where's the creativity involved in this? Again, we are going to be infusing math and art into all of this. Uh, both of these different fields are wildly creative. Erdos, again, super famous problem solver um, and like kind of more peripatetic, um, you know, kind of traveling. Everyone knows these sort of eccentricities of traveling around and you would actually have the host arrange where he was supposed to go next, cook, cook for him and things like this. Completely different from Groth and Deke who literally left like an erasing, an abdication. So let's talk about these in a little more detail. Um, 
again, we're just going by like references. Neither one of us have met these people. So um, Eridosh is famous for saying, you don't have to believe in God, but you should believe in the book. So the book is this, uh, his, his, uh, he actually believed that there was a book that contained the most elegant theorems and uh, expressions. And we say, what can we make of this sort of, he treats the self as it's purely as its mathematical value. Self is mathematical value through his belief in the book of divination, containing the most elegant proofs and theorems. Literally, according to like the life, I think according to Erdos was in its mathematical value. That's it, right? How many things can I publish? Uh, what can I do? He is famous for stopping um, the use of like an amphetamine or something like this, and uh, for a, like for a month because his friends were worried about him. And anyway, so he famously says, you know, you've you've held mathematics back because you stopped me, right? Uh, I I looked at the blank paper like an ordinary person. That's what he says, right? So um, it's it's a little ruthless, you know, <laughs> but it says that you held me back. I looked at the paper like an ordinary person. And this is all in the autobiography and it's also in the paper we talk about it. So Young quotes St. Paul famously, and he says, yet not I live, but Christ liveth in me. So we ask, did Erdos not live, but the book liveth in Erdos? I think that's one of our most profound statements in this paper. Let's jump to Grothendieck. Grothendieck was after, um, he actually writes about what he says is a profound symbiosis between the hand that writes and the spirit or thought and of the creative act as the archetypal act of the human spirit. So by stating something like that, there is a thought to believe that Grothendieck was aware of Jung's work and this is very reminiscent of the actual virtual point. So, you know, Grothendieck, um, you know, does not attend like the Fields Medal ceremony, grows up stateless. Uh, it's a completely different like uh, being and a completely different relationship with self. So we say, what can we make of his literal disappearance? So being in the IHES, you know, he was uh, heavily anti like the military funding and stuff like that, um, but literally just left, right? Left and said, like, what can we actually make of that literal disappearance? Can we in particular see Grothendieck, see in Grothendieck's concept of a site, which is, again, I haven't defined that, it's a category with a topology on it, um, very particular topology on it. Can we see in Grothendieck's concept of a site, um, uh, is that an abstraction of a point, um, an urge to grasp the virtuality and dislocation that Jung ascribes to the self? So what is that? You know, is that an actual way of grasping the virtuality and dislocation that Jung ascribes to the self? How do you go from topos theory, um, um, laying the wakes for uh, beautiful work in like a telcoomology, algebraic geometry, uh, um, you know, Grothendieck group, laying the matter for K theory, all of this stuff, to a question that haunted Grothendieck, which was, what is a meter? What is a meter? We have a very, very technical definition of what is a meter. People, I think, have been kind of harsh with him and said something like, oh, well, at that point, he just lost his mind. I'm like, is that what happened? You know, is there a possibility that, like, what is the time of mind loss? Can we be a little more gentler with that, you know? So, you know, you go from topos theory to, like, you know, a complete uh, hermit existence after that. So a closing thought that we have to ask is about the limit paradox. And we say, we are left by the above not with an entity wrapped in a Markov blanket, but with an imagined entity wrapped in an imagined blanket. So we say a quantum reference frame specifies a semantics, so hence in the limit in which two agents fully share a common semantics and hence a common language, they no longer have separate identities. Language itself becomes paradoxical. Information is nonetheless shareable, although unfungible. Communications exist. This text exists. You reading it exists. The meaning you ascribe to it exists, most importantly. Contradiction. Indeed, a true contradiction, a dialethia, a limit paradox. So we say such paradoxes arise wherever there is self-reference. And it shows how science applied to itself generates these limit paradoxes. So indeed, creative acts are limit paradoxes. We can go like, uh, you know, the, the model that we construct, I want to like formally finish there, but um, everyone can find there's more information about the, the very like empirical model that we define. Our most important theorem is that an entropic categorization is a condensed set. So we talk about like 
the phenomenology of categorizing, you know, events, places, things, people, memories. And, you know, we call uh, time is actually entropic because there is a flow of information that it values um, learning over forgetting. So once you have a disruption in this flow of learning versus, you know, versus uh, forgetting um, in something like an Alzheimer's or something like this, then is time no longer entropic in that case? So that's why we call these categorizations entropic, and we're going to say that this is condensed set. So our, our famous prediction is that human retrospective and prospective memory um, are implemented by what are we, we're going to call sheafification functors from a single proatel site. So it's a site with a weekly atel topology on it. And it, so again, we're saying that mon monitoring the event-dependent phenomena through sites is the way that you know. Um, is a better way of monitoring continuity quote over time. So we're going to say if that's correct, then we expect to find no persistent neural representation of either past or future events, uh, only mechanisms for constructing uh, instantaneous representations. Yeah. And I think I just talk about that. Yeah. Why his satiety and the questions and yeah. So again, you know, can like sites, you know, reframe authentication dialetheistically and if you do have this like over time kind of thing, what time is that? You know, great. Okay, so I'll stop there. Or All stop right. like the formal thing there to begin a discussion if you wanted that. <laughs> I'll pause there in time. That I will pause there then. That I that I will pause somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's what that's the beauty of it. It's like. You know, you can trip over reality, right? But as you zoom in, it's very curious as to what is, like, what is holding all that together? <laughs> and it's very curious that the physicists working on that, you know, dive pretty heavily into Eastern thinking, or you have Grothendieck reading Young, you know, like trying to figure this stuff out. I don't know, what, what, what do you think would have a take on a, juxtaposing these vastly different ways of existing and interpreting their worlds right i want to pick up there mm -hmm. and then of course we'll just see where we go and anyone who's watching may also add questions so the juxtaposition of growth and Deek and erdos was very interesting and you described growth and Deek as a theory builder and erdos as a problem solver and that seemed to map back into that type one type two space like type one intuition is problem solving it's mm -hmm. like the the thing is falling off the table and there's a reflexive response to solve the problem even before there's a theory of the problem or mm -hmm. someone is skiing and they're able to use their body and extended cognitive apparatus and skill and all of this to solve problems that aren't even stated in contrast <laughs> the development of theory and generalizations and to codify is a, a case independent process you're solving a ton of problems you're solving every problem of a nail needing to be hit the hammer solves above any specific nail but also it solves no specific nail and um that i felt like was very illustrative and spoke to potentially other continua of doing and thinking. What do you think about that? No, yeah. Yeah, just again, it brings me back to this like St. Paul, like beautiful quote, yet not I liveth, but Christ liveth in me. So that also seems, uh, that's tricky. I'm not sure if that's like case independent. Right. Yeah, it's almost like uh, I like that solving the problem before there exists a theory of the problem. That's tricky. That's tricky. Uh, and you know, the the question is like, what is the sense of self of a problem solver and versus a theory solver? Do you have to have a uh, less tethered sense of self to be a theory builder because you're trying to figure out? for all possible nails. And that's, I think, that's, I think, uh, I think a lot of mathematicians do that, 
right? Because it's just all about the, nobody really cares if you're well or not. It's sort of just like, did you ace this exam? Did you ace this exam? Did you finish the theorem? Did you do all of this? And so everybody knows, you know, the reason there's a lot of like, you know, mental health, like scares in fields like mm -hmm. that is because nobody really asks how you are. So I'm wondering if all the ideas about how is Shanna? Is she eating today? She's sleeping? All the, you have to push it aside. You know, look at all the pressure that Grothendieck's under. You have to push all the like Grothendieck aside to be an abstraction to create these theories. To create these theories. Let me put the self aside in order to create that many theories. Versus somebody like Erdos, I don't think was particularly deeply emotional about these things or something. But, you know, Grothendieck had a lot. There was a lot there. And it's notorious in his, like, you know, 800-page letters to people, right? Something, like, who is he writing for? Who is he writing for? He dipped out, does not want to be found. So there's a, a nice website that kind of, like, talks about, like, last interactions. Some, a few mathematicians kind of saw him. So they opened the door, and the look was sort of like, you know, I, I don't want to be found. So what, what can you make of that? Like, I don't want to be found, yet I'm going to be writing profound volumes, right? I don't even think, what do you, I don't even think that's a self that, it's interesting to not want to be found, but to continue to write. Who's the, who's the writing for when it is still in this sort of like epistolary form? Who's he writing to? So it's almost like, again, like, you had to get rid of all the emotionality or put it somewhere else, which makes me think of like any mathematician is skilled on that, that young sort of line between conscious and unconscious and the self being like a point on it. You know, a lot of mathematicians will identify as heavily, um, you know, autistic or something like this. Right. And why is that something that helps the mathematics? Is it because your mind was free of the emotional turmoil of being a subject of something like this, you know, it's, you know, um, it's really sad. You could, you know, what if you had like something emotional happen to you? Everybody knows you're not going to be able to perform very well on a math test. So what, what is that? What is it that the theorems like are trying to trump the emotionality or something like that? So you almost have to be in this monk state probably, or have a life that does not have a bunch of peril in it to do well on these theorems. And so what do you think about that? Like, to do some of these like hardcore sciences, maybe you have to put the self aside or you abstract it. I don't know. Well, a few things there. It seems related to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and indeed the um, higher order, though higher and lower is just a spatial metaphor. Um, it's possible for someone to be having the worst emotional day of their life, but their blood pressure is regulated. And there mm -hmm. are complex feedbacks. The way one feels can influence their physiology and vice versa. But then zooming out to the level of the researcher involved in theory building, as well as the problem solver involved in applications like kind of research and practice that is enabled by the physiology of society. And mm -hmm. so it is um, a scaffolded mm -hmm. work that can influence the whole. You, you mentioned the um, epistolary nature mm -hmm. of growth and Dick's writing, which means in the form of letters. Mm -hmm. And that's quite a connection, not just to the Bible and certain mm -hmm. books of the Bible, which are written as letters, mm -hmm. but also to this emergence of art as sight. If the mm -hmm. art is a letter, a letter is to someone. Someone could write a letter to themselves in the future, or it could be like a letter whose kind of ironic performativity is that it's to no one or it's to um, some imaginary character. But the genre and the format of art that is a letter is needing to be mailed and it has to be opened and read. And so Ooh. I think the letter is like a very plain text performance art. Yeah, that's really beautiful because, again, you know, there's like some sad things that occur by letter too, right? So some things, it's interesting. It's interesting that it's like, let me write this. Let me deliver it to you so that I'm not there when you open it, right? It can take, you know, that's like the nature of surprise or maybe like a partner leaving somebody. You know, you hear these horrible stories, right? Or like, or like suicidal thing, like I left a note. It's interesting that that the letter writing 
yeah, what is that? I like that needed to be mailed. I love that. You know, there's like photos of the place that he was at, like in France, just in the, I don't know, the, I think the population is like 150. It's tiny. And uh, volumes, volumes. Like, it's like mailed to whom? And what's our mail system? I don't think this is like, you know, Hedwig sending, <laughs> sending it by owl or something, but it's almost like, I don't know. And that's why we were fascinated by that. Because you go from someone who already excelled in everything, but had a very harsh upbringing into that world. And they all say that. They're like, you know, this isn't like the normal person that comes to like a, you know, mathematical like place. And so in one sense, like, you know, I like that. I like that it gave him more. Whereas some people saw him as so strange. I was like, maybe that's why, you know, he did so much, you know, because he came in with something different. And, um, you know, you could also say that he was just sick of sort of the, the bureaucracy of everything. But, you know, we, you know, are like lost mind. And Chris and I were like, maybe there's something deeper there. Can we be, be more gentle to someone in a state like that? You know? So I like this needing to be mailed. I have no idea. And again, a lot of mathematical work, you know, Robert Langland's, like it's famous for trying Langland's program by writing a letter as well. But it didn't have this same like depth to it. You know, so Grothendieck was on something else which is why I really relate because he's always about the philosophy in there. You know, I've often been perplexed. I remember like, whenever I learned like, you know, acceleration or something per second, per second. It's like, what is that? And then you can do it again per second, per second, per second. And it's like, you know, what are these fundamental units? Uh, Beckett talks about that in a lot of his work as well. So we're really perplexed that, you know, that Chris and I are able to slide around. Like we know who we are in a sense, but we're not tied to something and we're open that we ourselves can be able to uh, intersect, I think, these heavy ideas and look at like, look at these grandiose personalities from such a different space. So it's like, yeah, there's theory building, but again, like, you know, when you mail a letter indefinitely, is it a message in a bottle that only somebody will read? And, you know, there's kind of different, it's like, is it a mail, is it a letter addressed to someone or is it just addressed, you know, to the fact that quantum mechanically it'll be opened at some point? You know. All right. A few interesting thoughts here. Very yeah. early, you said thoughts, and then you quoted an author, and you said the paragraph begun with, at any rate, you have them. Well, hmm. rate is what? Something through time. Hmm. So even that uh, just turn of phrase speaks to time. Mm -hmm. And then, is the self a theory? Well, mm. it does theorize about certain things, and that was related to self in the sense of self. Is the self a problem to be solved? Is mm. the self a solution to a problem? So where in the Grothendieck Erdos type one, type two space is self, self as problem, self as solution, theory of mm. self as problem, theory mm. of self as solution? I love that. Oh, wow. Maybe that's the open-endedness because I know some of the math stuff stopped and then he was just like enchanted by this notion of meter, light, speed of light and things like this, you know? And uh, I don't know, you know, there's been a lot of like cool work about different physical theories about like a non uh, a variational speed of light and things like that, you know, um, or like primordial black holes. So there was like, you know, or maybe is Grothendieck just really alone? Was there like, well, you know, you, you have to think about things like that. You know, if you had a collaborator or somebody that talked to you, like you or me, would that have changed something? I don't know. I don't know. You have to think about like, is the abdication, yeah, is the abdication a problem or a solution? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure, you know? So, but again, like, you know, uh -huh, go ahead. Don't the solutions one day turn into problems tomorrow through time? See, through time. At any rate, you have them. No idea, you know? Yeah. And again, we all know that to be high level functioning, like, you know, someone like you and I are people watching this, able to like follow this thread. Um, you have like, we are able to function. So Chris told me that very well. I'm highly imaginative super hyper uh, fantastic, right? And yet I'm like extremely functional, extremely functional. So we all know that deficit functioning can start plaguing, um, you know, certain people like uh, diagnosis schizophrenics or something like this that are actually unable to recognize the internal thoughts 
as their own thoughts, you know. And so uh, sometimes neurology can be a little like not so kind or something like that and say, oh, you're unable to recognize the inner voice as your own. I remember I asked Chris that a couple of times. I was like, Chris, whenever we're sitting there thinking to ourselves, like, uh, who is that? Who is that that you're actually talking to? And he said, Shannon, just open, like, speak whenever that thought is there. Whenever the internal thoughts are there, just open and, and speak. Sure enough, it was the same speaking voice that was inside. And I thought, okay, so that that's, so that's not as mis mystic as I thought. But somehow, if you're unable to source monitor and reality monitor that, like, what does that actually mean, you know? So in the case of like deficit functioning or something like that with these like, you know, with schizophrenics, then you have to think um, like, how can you slowly reintroduce noticing the inner self to an extent that doesn't like blast apart the, you know, the current self, if that makes sense. You know, it must be kind of scary to say, oh, well, there's another person inside of me that thinks like this? Or, okay, that's not the other person that thinks like this. It's actually me. I'm just not recognizing the other axes of me, like you kind of said earlier. So I think, you know, you either have to be very chill with the fact that you have so many systems running at the same time, or you're hyper aware, like Chris and I are, and you're functional with it. Because I think if you're hyper aware and you're non-functional, then you're not going to be able to leave the hyper fantastic world and like save your child. You have to come back, right? So people like John Nash and things like this. Again, it, you know, math and physics will do this to people because there's it's such a pressure cooker, such a pressure cooker. And again, I think you have to put the self aside or something like that, which needs to be dealt with. But at a certain point, you know, the hallucinations like do occur. And, you know, John Nash is like literally seeing people, right? So, and that famous like scene in A Beautiful Mind where he's like, oh, I'll watch, you know, I can give the baby a bath. And, you know, the baby is like almost drowning. <laughs> and the wife, you know, runs in, his wife runs in. And, you know, she's like, what happened? He goes, well, Charles is taking, you know, <laughs> Charles is taking care of the child, you know? So for me, it's like, I'm interested in this. Can you be an excellent mathematician on this scale of Groff and Deacon Erdős and still care for your child? Can you swing back to the actual conscious, if you're a virtual point, if you have to quote, focus, right? People say, I need to get rid of distractions so I can focus. Can you actually focus and then go save your child, right? Like this would be a sense of self. What do you think about that? Then you're like, I'm, I'm able to recognize my inner thoughts. I'm not going to be pushed to a deficit functioning, right? I'm going to be able to recognize what is real and what is not. I'm not going to let hyperphantasia tilt my complete axis, but I'm going to be able to come back and be able to go fully to the imaginary space and come back and take care of my family or stop at that red light. Like, what do you think about that? Well, a few things. I'll, I'll respond to that. And then mm -hmm. two other areas that we're going to be touching upon are art, visual art, and history of philosophy. Just mm -hmm. kind of planting that. So as to the, is it possible to be functional and imaginative mm -hmm. in the context of, uh, deficits mm -hmm. what if we flipped it and said it's a surplus of free energy and the lack mm -hmm. of the deficit is the surplus and so mm -hmm. that just does this kind of minimum maximum inversion that happens so often in the fep and then mm -hmm. also um with this again type one to type two problem solving to theory building erdos to growth and dick axis that we're working with it seems like both of them in a social cultural context can be aligned with service or not. Mm -hmm. Someone can develop theory or they can ruminate on theory and have a um, failure to serve. Um, and although some mathematicians and there's a particular mode with academia and everything as we know it today, where people might be obsessed with a proof and that leads mm -hmm. them to neglect the bathwater, mm -hmm. somebody else might be thinking about free throws in their head, or mm. they might be practicing their other skill. And mm -hmm. so there's different modes of rumination that might be just for different people in different situations, look more professional, technical, academic, or might be, more, which is theory building, mm. or closer to problem solving 
and thus resemble more of a um, mechanical, obsessive, compulsive situation. Mm. To art? Well, in the title of this paper, there's, of course, the creative and fun portmanteau of math art. And also the paper situates itself as describing the period from 1920 to the present. Now, I guess it's always the present. That's why they call <laughs> it the gift. Um, but we can just take it as 2022. So what happened from 1920 to 2022? Why 1920 as a beginning? And could you mention any movements in aesthetics or art? Impressionism, Cubism, Pointillism, all these just different schools of art and fads and hype cycles. What has happened since 1920 and how does that relate to your deeper stances? Yeah, so again, we're just seeing that through line that, you know, of, of elimination, abstraction, reification, uh, what Yves Klein, blue on blue, right? Where do you go after that? Where do you go after white on white? And so I think we're saying you have endless places to go through white on white. So instead of just giving up and saying that, you know, once you've abstracted everything to a point, I think that's where it's almost like, uh, it's like, it's like a seesaw or something where art, you know, thought it was maybe kind of done. Math swooped in and said, you know what? What is a point? What is a point? What is color? Why don't we try to create dark colors? Right? So we all know that, you know, dark energy and things like this are what 90% of this place. Baryonic matter is like such a small percentage. So you have a light spectrum, you know, that uh, I don't know that white light is prismatic. What about dark colors? You know, since dark energy does not interact electromagnetically with matter, could we create a dark energy equivalent of the color, color wheel? You know, the color of a wheel looks like the circle of fists. So I think there's like a lot of places for, you know, uh, white on white to push through towards when you start questioning what is white, what is things like this. So we're saying that like through that abstraction, through the dissolution of the self, if you're going to abstract it away, you have to really talk about what the self is. If you think you have abstracted it away, you really need to talk about what the self is. And so I think what we've done is shown that through 20s, right, with Dada and all this kind of stuff, you know, advent of like quantum mechanics and things like that, huge explosion on all kinds of realms, that I think you can be guided by a couple of things, limit paradox, limit paradox, right? The, the nature of self-reference, <laughs> You know, even when you have something as anesthetic a term as self-reference, what is this self? So I think uh, what math is going to do is ask art to please ask, what is self? And can you take these two lines? Can you draw from a virtual point? What does Jung have to do with the intersection of math art? Is math art an inevitable consequence? And that's what Chris and I are kind of like alluding to that you have to join them possibly to get out of white on white. Join them together, let them merge forces, and then you can start mathematizing autoscopia and figuring out different spaces, right? So like if a point is no, like how do you define a point, like a zero dimensional object or something like that? But if you re-identify point as a Grothendieck site, then you have actually infused a new set of infinities into that point. So Chris and I are advocating for if you think you've done it, if you think you've gotten rid of the self, if you think white on white, if you think you've just squished everything to a point or something like that, well, the Grothendieck notion of a site and category theory is going to always allow morphisms and ways out. So I think it's kind of cool that like, you know, in the vein of like Deleuze, we should follow Deleuze and Guattari uh, through this work of Hesaidi, try to invoke a mathematization of Hesaidi, and then you can see something like, body passing through itself like i think art can always go further go through white on white what does that actually look like you know like create 
create the white hole, create quote on the other side, create all sides at once. I know I always do this thought experiment of like, you know, what if I could draw an object from 360 degrees or what if I could be, you know, or like, you know, if you want to proceed by the way of like limit paradoxes, why is it that every day I wake up and I'm the same, you know, I'm not like a lobster or something like that. So these kind of thought experiments, I think can like, I don't know if, I don't know if what I said makes any sense, but does that make any sense that you can push through this and that maybe possibly math art is like a, a necessary emergence or does math art become the space of affordance? You have such great ideas. What do you think about any of that stuff? Well, to return to this historical dance and interplay with philosophy, art, and math. <laughs> I'm reminded of the development of perspectival drawing in the, let's just say, latter half of the 1000s millennia, where there's a few points. There's the vanishing point. That's like the classic, you know, on the horizon, you draw the string and all the buildings go towards it. And then there's also the, the point of perspective and there's like the light point source and there's the center of gravity. And all of these complexities, relational complexities, do play into that zero dimensional point concept. If we have a rich point concept, like to point at, perhaps, to point at a locus of action, or to use a point concept like that from Bucky Fuller's Synergetics, where a point is just a tetrahedra that you're seeing as a speck, but it's a geometry of lumps. And so you have space packing of finite, actual space enclosed shapes. And a point is just one that you're really far away from. It's outside of your you're kind of tuned into it. Then there's more richness. And there's also a, an inherent plurality in those points. Whereas the vanishing point and the Cartesian observer, mm. it's um, it's narrow, mm. and then that leads to potentially a narrow, or fragile, or overfit self, for whom even small changes can be extremely troubling. Whereas if the self is more like a swarm or a locus of action, mm -hmm. then certain phenomena that might be more troubling, potentially up to and including death, are more naturally part of the becoming of that locus rather than the cessation of a point. Mm -hmm. I love that. And then from the nature of authentication, if the self is multiple, so I completely agree with you on that. There is nothing fixed and a swarm can more quickly uh, be able to respond, react. Can like theory, perhaps theory building will lead us to, to the self to be multiple in a swarm, I agree. Uh, with the ability for each point in the swarm, act, 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 act. So it could lead to a crescendo of actions. I agree. I know in like, you know, in really, really beautiful, like martial art training or something, teach you to be ready, be ready, be open. Because if I'm sitting here, like waiting for somebody to come this way and somebody comes behind, I'm already lost. Be open, be omni, right? So I think that's like, yeah, it's a different state. It's a different state. So theory building, I think absolutely relates with swarm thinking and swarm multi- so if point is multi, then point is able to engage with with more things. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's what sight is doing. So instead of having a like a final point, this is like the final point, uh, you know, sheaf theory and stuff like that is going to say above every point, you actually have things that collapse down to the point. So it's no longer even about the point. It's about taking the inverse image of the point and seeing what lives like upstairs. And hopefully that, that's what never ends. Yeah, so point more as portal, I think is what I'm more interested in, you know, uh, or self as portal, something like that. Yeah, versus in this, this finitude, I am this, I am this. Yeah, 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 well, that's, yeah. 
that's um, how we end sentences with a point. So it does have a, a fi finitude. A few more art comments. Mm -hmm. Kandinsky, the artist, had works that considered, for example, point and line to plane, which looked mm -hmm. at some complexity of geometry and topology on the plane, and um, also wrote concerning the spiritual in art, and spoke of uh, an outer sound and an inner sound. Mm. And I think that is kind of presaging this like dark matter of colors, like aren't colors defined by their visuality? Mm. It's like, well, yes, and matter is defined by its interactivity with other matter, mm. yet under those calculations, most of it isn't even doing that. So what is the inner color such that even though we know that the printed image or the computer screen is only displaying one RGB value, mm -hmm. what is it that allows you to look at someone's cheek mm -hmm. and see depth? And how mm -hmm. does that sort of inner sound and inner color relate to the letter being received? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I do think uh, Deleuze helped herald that while well, that book is not written in the 1960s, but like the, you know, I mean, <laughs> like wherever he says the, you know, painting as hysteria. So mm -hmm. I agree. It gives that sort of, um, uh, it's no longer about the color. The color passes through at the same time. So there's um, uh, levels of becoming. So the the brush stroke right becomes uh, an antiseptic or a, a, like a a form of abdication body leaving at this is the same time that the smear or the brush stroke right leaves color so color becomes representation uh, i becomes polyvalent and that's the kind of thing that i think um with respect to what you said that deleuze can can give us that so Kandinsky, you know, saying, you know, inner sound, outer sound, and Deleuze, I think, would completely agree and point to something like Francis Bacon, whose work is defying that subject-object relation. So you just see like a scream, right? A lot of his figures just have open mouths and things like that. So you're just seeing the intensity of it without the subject-object copula. And for some sense, there's an immediacy in that, like there is an aha. So the sense of the scream is definitely not, <laughs> I, I don't think it's of the same time as like, I paid my rent today, right? I, you know, so it's, um, it's at the level of ghastly, which whatever that is. So that's why Chris and I are saying that all works are, you know, uh, creative, like whatever type they are in the proportion of like true provocatization, right? So here I am, here's a work of art. I'm going to like take away your continuity and subject ob object Coppola. And I'm going to make it a, his, a hysteresis. And I'm going to put uh, eyes everywhere. Eyes everywhere. So that leads into, again, like multiple swarm, swarm thinking, you know, put eyes in your head. You know what I mean? Eyes everywhere. And so I like what you say, like, it's not about RGB. Um, it's not about RGB. And you have to think about people like, uh, how does Clive Waring see color? So I think we need to be really careful about these sort of like molar structures. Color is this. And, and rephrase that as to what color could be when it leaves like circle of fists or when it leaves this. Or merge color with something else, you know. Have another like synesthetic experience and what is that. Um, yeah, so I think uh, Deleuze did that really well of taking these ideas and actually noticing in Bacon's work like a symptomology. A symptomology oh this is a symptom of hysteria right and not hysteria again like not hysteria of the like painter but hysteria of painting itself so i think that's very cool to give life force to the painting and allow painting itself to become but it you can't like fix it so i like how he says that it's like he has this whole book about uh becoming sorcerers and things like that and so he was like a critic a critic of freud that sometimes for reducing everything people would come to him with severe problems and he would say, oh, it's because a, a dad issue or something like that. So it would always like localize it um, versus having like polyvagant organs everywhere. You know, something like that. Yeah. Right. 
I'll give some comments and I'll read a very nice quotes from Ali in the chat. So what that made me think about is the hunter is an identity. Hunting is a process that's happening in time, but the hunt, the game, the forage, those are more of these um, Heseides. Mm -hmm. They exist abstracted from the process and from the identity though we may linguistically symbolize it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll read some quotes that Ali's added. These are, um, I think, bring a lot of depth to the pieces you've raised. So returning earlier to discussion of problem and problem solving. Mm -hmm. So this is from Jeffrey Bell, an inquiry into analytic continental metaphysics. And the quote is, a problem is a non mirological parts and holes, non-mirological part of its solution, meaning a part that cannot be separated and detached from that of which it is a part. And this is a part, more, moreover, that is not exhausted by the determinate solution of which it is a part. And I think mm -hmm. in terms of the history of philosophy, and then feel free to add any comments, mm -hmm. we can contrast this problem concept, theory of problems, growth and dig on Erdos, and we can contrast this enmeshed relationship of problem and solution with a classical Hegelian dialectic of the sequential nature, problem, solution, consequence, or other ways to state the Hegelian dialectic, but that is often framed in time as like, first there's a reaction, then there's a counter reaction, then there's a synthesis as opposed to this instantaneous assemblage concept of problem and solution in which they're all coexisting. And mm -hmm. so therefore the seeds of the solution are in the problem and vice versa now mm -hmm. rather than through time only. And maybe both are applicable. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, thank you for these beautiful quotes. I do love, uh, I always tend to respect everyone for trying so everybody's trying these theories and, you know, I myself always had a problem with it's like, okay, uh, you know, nature of the problem, like thesis, antithesis or whatever, and then uh, synthesis. So I jumped right into Adorno's negative dialectics. I thought that was really powerful because in Adorno's thinking, you know, like that synthesis, don't let the synthesis hurt the multiplicity. And so it's like, can you have thesis and antithesis? and then have a synthesis that doesn't destroy both. That's why we think the nature of this is to go through dialetheism. Imagine a beautiful world where you could have A and not A existing. And this is why I think people wouldn't hurt each other so much, you know, or wouldn't like make these harsh comments like, oh, they lost their mind or something like this. And it's like, maybe they're in this dual state. Maybe it is this state of, you know, Shanna wants a banana, but she also doesn't. So I think the way out of this is gonna be kind of hefty and it's going to be through merging these two beautiful quotes that were just spoken. Can you merge these in a way that doesn't lose them both? Right. And that's the nature we've been struggling with for a long time. The nature of conflict. Could it be to uh, lessen the conflict by going the dialetheistic way through negative dialectics? Can you actually do that? What kind of a space, what kind of a new affordances would you actually need? to be able to hold both states. And I think that's, possibly that's where we're getting. Could you be both Groth and Dieter Erdos? Could you have, you know, Hegel and Adorno actually in a room talking to each other? And what does that actually mean? Um, I, we just need to always be quick to not mute or take away, you know, the voice of someone who possibly cannot speak, you know? So uh, to just say deficit functioning is what's causing these things. Like, can you actually, can we hold Clive? Can we like hold that space? Uh, and I think in the nature of these two quotes, I'm reminded of a Clive, uh, uh, a quote that Clive said where they asked him, uh, where is home? I've spoken about this before. And he says, home is yesterday. So I found this doubly perplexing because here's someone whose concept of time is six seconds. Clive doesn't even have a yesterday according to my sort of Western thinking. <clears throat> but yet he says, home is yesterday. And Clive is not an invalid. There's something actually here. So I think, you know, to say thesis, antithesis, synthesis, 
you could be excluding the synesthetes or somebody hyperphantasic like me that can at the same time see problem, like can see all of them at once and it becomes like almost unbearable, you know? So what kind of mindset are we valuing when we value like someone who can actually see, see these as, what about for someone who they all happen at the same time? And so that's like in the synesthetic realm, um, I think we not to, need to not exclude that. Let us not exclude that. But also with the regards to those two quotes, you have somebody like Barth saying, if you're really going to have like a synthesis, please make sure it is not antifrastical and that we are not lying, right? Please make sure you're not saying that you support something which you actually aren't. You know, don't try to support the voice that you're diminishing at the same time. So I agree. How do we, how do we hold affordances that will lead to um, a swarm, a very dynamic agent, a dynamic agent that is a... Uh, um, that is capable of becoming, capable of becoming and not lost in it. Let us not find nihilism in the limit paradox. That's the beauty of math. That's why I think math and art can really help each other because mathematicians will just like, oh, you're telling me there's no solution to X squared is negative 25. Well, I'll invent I, you know what? I'll go up a dimension. And so that's what I think we need to do to logic. Can we add another dimension to logic? Can we actually work in dialetheism? How can we do that? You know, can we add another axis on painting? Art is, art is wild with that. Can we add another axis of creation? Can we try to paint from 360 degrees? Can we imagine everything from all points of view? Like that would be a purely omni existence, right? I had a, a discussion, it turned out to I don't know, kind of a feud with a friend who, um, you know, I don't like losing things and it's very hard on me. Um, so um, like people or, you know, animals and things like that, it makes me very sad. But it was like, um, uh, you know, I was like, I wish everything was infinite. And he actually challenged me that I wouldn't be able to handle hard infinity because he said even the horrible memories would last forever and things like this. So is there a way for us to like put the thought and the spacing so you'd be able to handle these things that were possibly infinite, infinite becomings and things like that without dipping the infinity into like nihilism, you know? Thank you for those quotes. They just spawned all of that, you know? <laughs> Could you describe what, dialetheic means and how it's used here yeah so um uh so dialetheism is a logic that removes the law of the excluded middle so if everybody knows this like i always find first order logic very limiting to creatures such as vivacious as us so the the excluded middle says something like you know p or q not p therefore q i thought this was so incredibly like boring and limiting I'm like, what, you're assuming that uh, I am not multi-sentient, I'm not a multiplicity, and that I'm definitely not a synesthete, you know? So dialetheism is going to replace that and say you can have a logic that's structured such as P or Q, not P, therefore P. So I think it is completely revolutionary, and it's a very, it's a nice logic that would uh, befit quantum mechanics and things like this, right? It is the very nature of having a parallel universe. So if you do believe many worlds, um, which I think most people have to at these days, unless you posit an infinite observer, then you are guaranteed the existence that at every mode of uncertainty, there is no collapse of the wave function. Everything is realized. How do you do that in a language? The language would have to be dialetheistic. You'd have to replace the law of excluded middle with something like, oh, Shanna chose like the pink sweater to wear for the talk today, like instead of the blue. The instead of also has its own reality, but the ontological status of that is very beautifully like questioned by Chalmers and all these amazing people. And so uh, the dialetheism would actually be able to give you pink sweater and not pink sweater. And so I think someone like Chris and I being trained in that are able to hold these very interdisciplinary papers. You know, if you know me, I'm such an advocate for like, can we please design like a universal institute where like, you know, Daniel, me, Chris, everybody's in a room thinking, artists, mathematicians, like physicists. So there is, there is excellence to be to being the problem solver just in with respect to your discipline. But can we open this a little bit and become more theory builders? So I think that um, by merging, you know, the I think you have to have a different mindset, something like me and Chris that are open to the sort of P, uh, you know, that this is natural to our language to say both P and not P. Then we're capable of writing these very heavily interdisciplinary papers. You do find some people that are like, I don't think I'd be able to work interdisciplinary because my field is this. Well, why don't we merge them? You know, and if merging leads to contradiction, then that means our definitions weren't good enough, right? Like math people love paradox and uh, you know limit paradoxes. It's like let me do better. 
Let me try a little harder. Let me make that definition just a little better. Ah, point leads to like UV infinities. I don't like this thing. I'm going to make a string. I'm going to make a string. I'm going to make a string. That, that might help. You know, what is a string? I don't know. <laughs> and so there's this wild aha intuition driving all of physics. They're very, 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 you know, all of the hard sciences are very heavily trained. So we're saying like, don't lose the aha. And it's perhaps the aha joined with the technique that's actually doing something like this. So again, if you could, that's what uh, dialetheism means. And so in this case, right, uh, the dialetheistic work is that you have both a painting of color, but you also have an autoscopy at the same time. It seems like those would actually tear apart the notion of form, but it's like you have this notion of underneath, right? So dialetheism is questioning whatever you're calling the level of awareness and like, you know, fundamental units of life. So, you know, I've taken, you know, sick people in comas and things like that. Like, sometimes they can still hear you. It's like, let us not be so hierarchical about the fundamental unit of life, you know? And so if you can open yourself, then you can have like, I don't know, maybe Chris and I are just trying to get quantum mechanics, like more in the macro state. And then you have like, you know, dialetheism and stuff, but I'm also more gentle because I know it's hard. You're like, no, I want that. No, I don't. That's like the basis of like very human existence, right? I would love that, but I wouldn't, you know? So we are, it's like, we are those kind of creatures, you know? So uh, we're just trying kind of like uh, Deleuze is doing with hysteria and saying that painting releases the presence underneath representation. Chris and I are trying to write interdisciplinary works to release the dialetheism beneath um, the sort of siloness, you know? Well, thanks. Just a, a comment and then some, some more great uh, Please, yeah. from, from live chat. So if there is a unitary Cartesian observer perspectival drawing world that we're in, then it's not even really an excluded middle. It's just either in one place or the other. <laughs> Whereas the swarm, the assemblage must be in multiple places. Oh. And so it can be wearing the pink sweater and the blue sweater. Yes, as a quantum, multiple worlds. Yes, as an imaginary counterfactual and in embodiment. And so that's why the assemblage can do things now that even the most advanced processor can't do in series. Yes. Let me add some more great um, comments from the chat. So Ian from Inner Sense, this was referring to your desire and or not for a banana. Holding both states, taking the awareness of being in two minds about whether I want a banana or not, and applying that to global issues and group sense making. So multi-scale yes. holding space. Yes. And then also, um, Ali has added several comments, which I won't read all of them about different spaces and metric spaces. And also noted Corey Shores, the logic of Giles Deleuze discuss discusses dialetheism at length in the context of Deleuzean thought. Yes. Yay, the logic of sense. Yeah, that's like one of my favorite. Oh, what a what a what a beautiful audience. Um, we should all so, write papers together. <laughs> um, in our in our closing sections, where do we go? What do we do? Right? Or what are next steps? Yeah, next steps. We go everywhere. So Chris and I are working on that, like like that, you know, that if we could just get this theorem, like, you know, an entropic categorization is a condensed set, then all in that one sentence, we're saying time is entropic, it's still dynamic. And we're saying that like, um, making like, that it, it's not what we think it is, if we can get an event independent, uh, an event dependent logic, an event dependent notion of time, to make time itself be this multiplicity, then we're actually going to have like, a way to mathematize where maybe other fields stopped. So where I think where we go, there's so many places to go. We start merging. We start heavily more interdisciplinary fields. I want to, you know, what happens when the when the guitarist uh, paints? What happens when the painter sews? I'm really interested in these intersections. Use the things that we're really good at. It's like, it's like my literary skills that make me really good at math or the way that I talk. Like, I don't plan this. Look at how I speak. How is that? It's the artistic side, you know? And are these actually uh mutually opposed no so i think what we should do is like advocate again for like 
this multiness, not not thesis, antithesis, synthesis. How about thesis, antithesis, negative dialectics so that every voice is heard? How do you do that in a way that is not leads to like utter chaos? It's through the dialetheistic way. Can you see point, both points of view? Can you see both of these? Can they make sense in both ways? Um, and also to reincorporate like imagination, imagination. Don't forget it. Don't forget the value of creativity in these things and to really hone the aha moment, like take care of it. You know, so we're introducing something that's like, let us be more like more, more caring in these fields. So when you think like, like and think about the sense of self that drives the next space. So we're thinking like, hey, let's take this. What does math art actually mean? Math art is now, a, it's like a, you know, a dynamically growing portal neurodiversity right can we amplify the variations in these fields and that's why i think you know it's going to get a lot of resistance with like no 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 my my field is this you know my, my field is this you know but we're into amplifying the variations and whatever actually actually made that field you know so i think it's like now is like the best time ever to like you know it's like amplify fep through math art are there actually mirrors of each other the mirrors of each other in a way that doesn't die out it's like what happens when two mirrors see each other that's what we're after here it's like we can actually try to get a more um a more dynamical definition of self and to not just toss it away and to say deficit this deficit this deficit this deficit this you know it's like oh tell me how you see things how do you see things because we all know you see what you are it's undeniable you see what you are uh inner thought outer thought inner sound outer sound so we're here to like, I, I think the more people in the room, the better, right? So these very um, like exclusive uh, um, um, uh, institutes, I just work on this. I just work on this. I think like, again, my ultimate aim is to have this like universal institute where everybody's working. Everybody's working because you know what it's going to do? It's going to refine that problem in a way that's universal. So I'm really into universal languages, universal problems. Can you take that? rigid point of view that you have and make it dialetheistic can you imagine can you imagine everybody problem solving by universal languages or by dialetheisms then then the nature would already be you know people that have six languages it's impressive it's amazing because they can just pot like tilt 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 like the basis is universal but i can tilt if i actually need to i can tilt and just speak english or i can tilt and just speak mandarin whatever but i am trained in the higher dimensional space so I actually think that we do have these like Jedi powers and we need to actually like retrain ourselves. and don't forget that imagination is a gift. So if we can actually use it and not have it so excluded in the heart sciences, like it's like that aha moment is what led me to that, you know, that is pure aha thinking. And then, you know, perhaps if we were more gentle to things like that, we wouldn't lose people like Groth and Deke. You wouldn't lose these, you know what I mean? Like you just have to be more caring and open up the neurodiversity realm so that's what um and all the things that i'm in it's like that's my new like advocation line and so chris and i think that through more interdisciplinary works you know we can actually hone that dialetheism you can actually hone amplifying variations um yeah and amplifying like adaptivity so i think the only way to survive like what's going on right now is to be adaptive right and so we just want to merge fields so that we can actually you know uh merge a lot of like math into neurology so it's like could you actually have a, a brain as a you know uh, could you have a quantum mechanical notion of the brain brain is hologram you know is, is there a non-local behavior in the nervous system right a lot of neurologists are not trained in stuff like that right but infuse the mathematician and maybe we are so after the moc talk i gave like you know these really brilliant like neurologists reached out like hey i really like the model that you're doing so I just want all of us to sort of like work together. So if we could posit that Universal Institute, I think that's in the nature of like FEP, you know? <laughs> I don't know if what I said made any sense, but you can tell that like I care. And so what are we trying to do? It's like, we're not stopping with this notion of self. We're going to try to come up with theory of thoughts and we're just going to keep going until like um, we try to reach that universal language, you know? Like we're, we're comfortable with like limit paradoxes and we say it up front. What is the nature of true contradiction? The fact that you can still understand me in this very nature. You still exist, but I don't know how. Well, very nice. I'll add a few thoughts as we come towards our calm closing. So different fields 
connecting different fields. First, couldn't ask for a better last name or collaboration to make it happen. Um, <laughs> and is integrating different fields like building bridges between different agricultural fields? They're different spatial locations. Or is it actually like the electro and the magnetic fields in the mm. sense that these fields are actually different measurement devices might pick up on one or another or one mathematical model might consider these fields, but they're not spatially adjacent or sequential, but rather they're overlapping and they're mm. enmeshed and therefore how we model those fields and how they're connected. It's like that was the transdisciplinarity that we needed. It wasn't a problem out there to be solved by concatenating or composing. It was something about our own process. And then mm. just one last to those general and um, important social and participatory comments you brought up. In some other work, we've been thinking about how the disciplinary model groups people according to their identities, affiliations, and their practices. So a biology department might have affinity with other departments at that school or with other biology departments, and there might be a culture of microscopy, and there's the person who's skilled in microscopy, and those practices are what create that locus. It becomes that kind of a thing. And the person with a microscope might be asking identical questions and have identical uh, intentions and attentions to somebody who's using a satellite imagery or somebody who's writing poetry, yet the disciplinary model has fragmented those latent possibilities. And so in contrast with that disciplinary model based around shared practices and identities and affiliations in a commons model, people are linked through their shared concern, their shared stewardship and their meaning. And in those situations, we can be some people enjoying the park, some people are clipping the roses, other people are researching which fertilizer to use or if we even need fertilizer. And there can be many practices and affiliations at the public park under the auspices of a commons. And so potentially thinking of the epistemic ecosystem as a commons to be stewarded collectively rather than some sort of corpse to dissect in a disciplinary fashion might bring some new people into the picture. Wow, I love the shared stewardship. Like that is so, that is so beautiful. You know, it's like, wow. Can you imagine if like every hard science had to have an elective, like building a garden? Can you hold that harsh theorem and like take care of like a plant? Like that would be, wow, that would be so amazing, Daniel. I think we have to like, Wow. Let's grow a plant. Let's uh let's make the shared steward like stewardship. Wouldn't that be so cool? Like here's the and they kind of do it with like trade tech and stuff like that, like tech places. But I think like, yeah, it's almost like Elon's ad astra. It's like let's make it ad like ad infinitum universal or something like that, you know? <laughs> Take it to the limit. Let's do it. I'm so down. It's like, I mean, you have the audience for it, you know, like this what a great community. Yeah, shared stewardship. Wow. Hopefully one day. Let's keep fighting Indeed. for it. <laughs> Indeed. Well, thank you so much. What an amazing conversation. Really happy that you're all working on this vector and that you made time out to speak with us. So great times. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you for your lovely community that supports us. Thank you. Farewell. Bye. <laughs>